Hello and welcome to another episode of Invad Entry. My name is James Taylor and today we are going to be looking at dockerization of an application which is already developed. So if you haven't seen the last uh, three episodes, don't worry. In fact, I think there's an editing issue on the last episode. Uh, but don't worry because we're just going to presume that we have an application, which we do. We have a, a Django application which wants to have two entry points, one which will be uh, the web server and one which will be the Discord bot. Um, and we want to deploy that now, and the easiest way to deploy that in the long run is if it's dockerized. There is an element of pain in dockerizing uh, anything, so if you've got a, an application, there's always a little bit of a pain building your first container. But once you've done that, you'll get a much better quality of deployment because you're effectively pre-building everything in. You don't need to worry about that target system having weird installs, library versions, anything like that, it's sort of locking itself in. Or if someone goes onto that system and stores another application which updates libraries, you don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. So what we're going to do though is because we've got three entry points, we are, we are definitely going to have two containers. Okay, the, the I don't want to be running one container and then manually running uh, commands on that container. I want there to be actually separate containers specific for purpose. Uh, so one of these is going to be the web server, or the application server really, the one is going to be the runbot uh, command which we added as a Django management command. Uh, arguably I might make a third container just for doing the migrations, um, but uh, we'll come back to that I think. What I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to not build two containers, I'm actually going to build a third container which is going to be called, I think this is a thing called code site, is actually the, uh, the base name for my thing. So this is going to be called code site base, and what that is going, that's going to contain all of the libraries. We've got capitalization on all the libraries, all of the uh, code, everything that actually builds a working container, but it will have no command or entry point on it. And instead, these will basically inherit um, code site base, and it will be caught in like code site web. Whereas this one will be, also inherit um, code site base but it'll be code site web. Ideally as well, um, if I was doing this professionally, I'd use uh, like a GitLab runner and I'd use a container registry. I'm just gonna build them on the target machine, which of course is this pie behind me. Um, so I'm just gonna check this out from Git and, and build this. So this was sort of the inheritance going on. Building this once means all my library dependencies are built in once. As long as I have the same tag, which will be latest or whatever here, um, then these things will basically have exactly the same code inside them, just a different entry point. So it means these two things will be linked together inherently in there. It also means they'll share the actual images. So once I've downloaded and compiled this, compiling these two becomes, they're just one extra layer in between the two. In my head, when I was thinking about how I was going to explain this, I thought, oh, I'll do some live Docker development. I always think building the very first Docker image to be very slow, a bit painful working out what you are and aren't going to do, have installed. So I thought I would show uh, a little bit of config and actually show you where I got to rather than doing that line by line coding, um, either working out from scratch or just copying it from the screen. I think it was just easy to show you what, what is there. The first thing I did though, before I did any of that, was I sorted out or, or made ready my application. Because when I run this, um, I, I've got two options how to run this. The first option is I'm going to want customization of the config. The first option really is using end variables, in which case I'd have to go into my settings file and say pull this value from environmental variable. Um, and the other option is, is something called local settings, where you mount a local settings file, um, local settings.py, and that's actually going to get loaded in. So that exists on the operating system on the host, I think it's loaded in. I decided to go down the local settings route because uh, there isn't really a lot of difference between the end variable system and the local settings because you're going to have them both in a file on the machine. Okay. The main thing is this way you don't commit it. I have a copy on my computer for testing with and I have a copy on the server for actually running the production copy. Um, so we're going down the local settings route. The way I did this in Django, and there are two main ways of doing this in Django. If I go to settings up high, see local settings there, I'm not going to show local settings. Uh, you basically take the settings you want out of here and you put them in a file called local settings. And then you have this block of code where it says from local settings, import everything. Uh, and the asterisk there is important rather than just saying import local settings because you actually want it to appear in the namespace. So when I import from settings, it, it works. Okay, that's the correct thing. 
accept import error. Uh, you don't need to do the accept import error because you could just say if local settings doesn't exist error. Right, well, that's fair, but I've actually know it, it's not got error here. It will error when you try to do anything without the database because I put the database in that other system. So your two options are put it at the bottom of settings or put it at the top of settings. All other options aren't really like you say, oh, well, put it halfway down. Doesn't really make sense. If you put it at the top of settings, you will basically have access to anything you set in local settings. So you could leave the database config in here and you could then import that thing up here. By the way, secure key will be changed very shortly, just in case people are screenshotting this. I'm going to use the secure key. That's going to come from a, another place, an environmental variable in the next version I upload. And by the time you're watching this, I've already uploaded that. So. <laughs> um, so basically, you put you put your secret in your other file, um, and then you could just use it. So, so if it's at the top here, you could basically say secret key equals local local uh, local secret key. So that so all your settings, or you could try saying that doesn't exist. Uh, put some default value in. By putting it at the bottom, however you can put a value in local settings which overrides a value already defined here. So by this way, I can actually put my own secret key in local settings, which means that this value here isn't actually relevant anymore. I've actually completely overwritten it by having it at the bottom. So I like to put mine at the bottom so I can override any value in here. I could append to installed apps, for example, in my local settings, uh, customizing whatever. Um, so I like to do it at the bottom. It's completely down to your independent decision. There's pros and cons of both sides, whatever you like. Anyway, this is important. Local settings doesn't get compiled in. It's very important to say is that this, I don't compile from my working copy. I compile from a separate get checkout. So when I'm building, I should build that out. So local settings is on my git ignore, doesn't get com uh, checked in, and hopefully I never show it to anyone. Uh, let me close that now. So in local settings, I can now override settings and now set things. I have to put my database in there because I've taken it out of my main settings. And I have to put my, um, my my bot Discord token in there as well. What I now have is the Docker files. So the Docker files, I'm using Python 3 Slim, which is a very cut down Docker image. It's really nice to use cut down images because the less things you have in store, the less uh, security vulnerabilities you may have. That's, that, those are almost kind of saying. Also means your images are smaller, means they run faster, they're less to store. There's always benefits for using cut down. The problem is that we're using cut down certain things you want to install, such as cryptography, certain things you want to install, like MySQL Cloud, require a uh, to compile them in. So I, I basically always have to install GCC. What you can do is build this in a way where you actually do that, and then you also install um, the, the things which require it, and then you uninstall, you apt get purge GCC from your system. So you don't have those compilers still lying on the system. Um, it, it, it is a little bit more work in the long run to do that, but uh, but I think that it can be worth it. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm installing GCC. I also need LibMySQL client because um, I'm talking to a Maria database and MySQL client is, yeah. there is a My Maria client, but the MySQL client, it works fine and it's just working right now. So I'm leaving that in there. And then I have my libraries here. Again, I you could do uh, a copy uh, requirements requirements.txt in here, and then pip install dash r requirements.txt. That would be a better way of doing it, I think, um, especially when you start getting onto longer requirements. Uh, and moving off requirements text, starting to do pip lists, pip freezes, and whatever to have your uh, versions all locked in, it would be better than doing this, because these are the latest version of Django, which may be anything, it may not be compatible. It's not there's a new version of Pipe Discord. So pinning, deciding whether to pin libraries or putting controls on what you're going to compile. Because ideally you want to be able to rerun a build and make it make exactly the same thing. Um, as a volunteer thing, as a, as, as a hobbyist thing, this is going to be good enough for me because I'm just going to keep my images. And if I want to upgrade one day, I want to upgrade to the latest and greatest. So um, this works for me right now. And then I copy my code in and I set my work directory. So I'm having slash app as my, my working folder. And there's no run. That's it. That's This is the Docker file base. Um, now you may notice it doesn't say Docker file because uh, it's got its own name. What I then have is another Docker file, which this, which basically says from code site base. Now what annoys me a little bit in the Docker file, I don't think you can actually say tag like like you, there's no tag this as Docker file. I, I would love to be able to put in the file what I want the tag to be, but you can't. So in this one, I'm saying for code site base latest, um, that's the add this on the end. So that's an extra layer. Similarly, on the web one, I've got the same thing. Now, I am using run server here. I did say in the previous video I was going to use Uwiski, but I haven't got Uwiski. Um, I haven't been through the, the dev work or working out all the dependencies for Uwiski yet. 
So at the moment, I'm just going to do runs over there. Um, I don't actually run this amount. I'm only actually running... It's interesting saying, let's build a, a Django site which doesn't have any web component whatsoever. It's a really interesting idea. Um, but here we go. Here is our, our run bot. And, and it works. Like, like This is the thing. So in theory, if I go onto the box... Oh, um, for the build process at the moment, I've just got a, a build script, which... If it fails, it just goes on to the next command. So you've got to watch to make sure it does build nicely. Um, but you can basically go onto the box. I have realized not everything's checked in. But you can do git pull to make sure everything's uh, up to date. And then you just do build uh, if you're in the right folder. Dot build. There we go. I'm not on the box. I'm not on the box. That simple. This demo, this demo is going so well already. Uh, let's actually go to the box, which <laughs> the correct tab. I tell people you should use a different color thing. I've got a new laptop and I don't have the color swapper, which I normally use to swap when I'm on a server. Uh, let's make this a bit bigger so you guys can see what's going on. So in this case, I want to do my build, and it's doing the build for me now. It's already pre-cached these these app get installed because I was building it all last night. And it's going to be it's just everything in the cache, which is nice. Now, what it's actually doing here is doing three builds. So it's done the first one, Docker side, Docker code site base. Then it's built the code site web, and then it's built the code site run bot. So um, I then want to run those three commands. And again, I want to run these consistently. So my run command, I've actually made a run script here to make sure I run it consistently. I'm not going to use a Docker Compose or anything. I'm not saying this simple. Uh, what this is going to do, I've actually added the RM flag in here, so when it closes, it just deletes its image. Fine, I know I might lose some logs that way, but the logs, we'll talk about logging, better logging in a bit. Um, so what it's going to do here is basically run, it's called Discord Bot. It's going to load in a local settings file so on disk, and it's actually going to load that into the correct space inside the image. So ideally, you document on your Docker image saying this is the files you need to load in, this is what should be in those files. Um, and it's still got the name of the actual image I want to do, and ideally that would be code site, code site run bot latest, uh, because it's going to build from its local local cache anyway, run from its local cache. And some networking bits and pieces, and the ports will all open up nicely. This actually doesn't have any ports, which is really nice. And that's it. That is that is my that's my run command to to spin up um, Docker. And I have another one for Maria. I have another run run Maria, which runs up my Maria container, make sure the right volumes are loaded up. Um, and that's what I have to do on the server. So now if I do docker ps, you can see that I am running the runbot, and I'm also running Maria um, on my Pi, and it's working really nicely. We've been running for 18 hours. And what's more is that that they connect together. So I've now got the setting for Maria in there. It the migrates from the database. And if I want to stop this, I can... Oh, it's called Discord Pop. can stop that it cleans itself up nicely after stopping obviously I, I've, I've tested stopping it nicely um, there we go and I can just do run scripts run me run bot what other file in there which was my debugging file and that runs it up correctly every time so it means that restarting the bot framework now means what I can do is I can actually compile the new version because um, I've got the tags, if I actually tag that version on the build as well, I can actually mean I can roll forward to a new version and roll backwards really nicely. Not using tags right now. The main issue with this was getting this Docker file up and running. Uh, what's important in the Docker build, on the build script, sorry, is that I use this dash F Docker file base. You still need to put the dot on the end to say build it in this folder, so it understands all the, the, the relative references. But the dash F says, don't look for the Docker file, look for a, Docker, look for a file with this name. And it runs those three in, in sequential order. So yeah, it's a really nice little um, system to build. I've got a nice little build system in here. I've got my code in here. I've got a really nice deployments process. Uh, the next thing for me is probably to build uh, like a fabric command. So from my computer, I, can, I don't have to log onto the server and run that sequence. I can run each of those steps one by one. And if it fails on the steps, it should error out rather than just continuing blindly to the next one. Um, at that point, it will also check the tags, because what I want to do is actually tag the Git repo, so it, it does the build to match the tag, and everything everything lines itself up. As I say, without using something like a GitLab runner or something, 
um, which there are problems with me using GitLab Runner because I, the GitLab can't necessarily see into my environment here, um, and I, I don't really want to run extra. Um, if I was running a lot of containers or, or or have lots of developers needing to push and build things and having deployed tooling and all the rest of it would make sense. In this case, it's nice and easy. So yeah, that is that is all I want to show today is basically a nice little build system. This has now been dockerized, it's now running. So you should be able to go onto the onto um, Discord and you should be able to go and talk to Invalid Entry and talk to him and and register your wallet as I showed in the last episode. Um, for those of you who don't know the Discord, the Discord is at invad-discord, tinyurl.com. Invad-discord, so come and join us there. Uh, we're still building that community up a little bit. I say we're getting ready for a 255 subscribers. Um, so if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And when we hit 255 subscribers, we are going to do a bit of a giveaway. Um, and it will require you having registered your Ethereum wallet in there, which there will be more instructions coming up in hopefully the next episode or so. Um, so yeah, that's where we are. Thank you very much, and I'll see you all in the next episode.